cages or wings, which do you prefer? Ask the birds. Fear or love, baby, don't say the answer. Actions speak louder, louder than louder than. They speak louder. It is another Monday night, and here we are with another edition of Keen After Hours. I'm Jonathan Silverstein, the artistic director here at Keen Company. We are an off-Broadway theater company in New York City, and we champion stories about identification and connection through the decisive moments that change us. Uh, I am so pleased to be joining you all uh, tonight. We have a very special guest, Mr. Kevin Kilner. Before we get going, I'd like to start tonight's event with a land acknowledgement. We do this to recognize the long history of the territory where we live and work and its significance for the indigenous peoples who lived and continue to live here and to demonstrate our commitment to addressing the legacy of colonialism in our work and practices. I am speaking to you today from Brooklyn, which is the traditional home of the Lenape people. Since our activities tonight are shared digitally to the internet, we'd also like to acknowledge and consider the legacy of colonial colonialization embedded within the technologies, structures, and ways of thinking we use every day. We are using equipment and high-speed internet not available in many indigenous communities. Even the technologies that are central to much of the art we make leave significant carbon footprints, contributing to changing climates that disproportionately affect indigenous peoples worldwide. We invite you to join us in acknowledging this as well as our shared responsibility to make good use of this time and for each of us to consider our roles in reconciliation, decolonization, and allyship. So, uh, I would like to welcome aboard my two fantastic co-hosts, Ashley and Billy. Come on out. Hello, hello. Hello. Oh, it's so great to be here, Johnny. We like come in as if there's a music sequence and we like have come, we've gone through a curtain. Well, I, I really should uh, like upload a, a virtual band to this, you know, <laughs> CGI, uh, CGI jazz band. Yeah. Please, next time. I think that's the next mm. step. I think that is yeah. the next step. Mm -hmm. How are you all doing this evening? Very excited. Very excited. I mean, I'm always excited. We're creeping but... towards Thanksgiving. That's not true. That can't be true. Next week. What? It's next, next week. What? American Thanksgiving? I know we have international listeners, so not Canadian Thanksgiving. American Thanksgiving is next week. My God. So we began this in mid-September, which feels about maybe two weeks ago. And longtime listeners will know that although this is Keen After Hours, the first iteration was Keen Office Hours, which took place during the day. So we've... we've um, you yeah, know? it's like how Saved by the Bell's first season was called Good Morning, Miss Bliss. Come exactly on, man. Exactly like that. Come on. <laughs> Hello, Charles Hi, Sperling. Hi, oh, Charles. Fans. Good to see you as always. So um, maybe, uh, would you just, Ashley, would you just give us a quick little primer about why we do this and sort of how it got started? Absolutely. So Keen After Hours is a weekly chat show featuring Team Keen, us, and um, theater luminaries. Uh, the long and short of it is that we are social people at Keen Company. Um, we love chatting with fellow theater companies that are on our floor at 520. Uh, shout out to Art New York. Um, and we missed theater people. And we thought maybe our patrons missed theater people too. So every week we sit down with a theater maker and uh, chat about their process and their career and uh, what they're doing. Well, yes, we do. And <laughs> tonight, tonight is um, an exciting guest because tonight, well, not only is the guest exciting, Obviously. but I think this is our first guest um, in a production from Keen Company Past that I was not the artistic director of. 
Oh. Oh. Right. That is a fascinating piece of trivia for our IMDb page. <laughs> <laughs> So shall we bring him on? Yes. Let's bring him out. I am so excited. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Kevin Kilner. <laughs> sorry, I, I was drinking a little. I'm sorry. We just caught you at home. Yeah. Cheers, Kevin. <laughs> anyway, yes. Hello, Mr. Kilner. Five o'clock somewhere. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So we like to begin um, each of these uh, little sessions with a little introduction. And um, this is something that I now do at every rehearsal. Uh, first rehearsal is I kind of introduce the room and tell a little story about how they're related to Keen and uh, et cetera. So um, here goes. <laughs> so um, I uh, knew of Kevin mostly from his TV work. Oh, sure. Um, and there was a specific sitcom in the mid 90s, uh, almost, oh gosh, it was you and this woman, and it was revolving either around a news show or an entertainment show, and you guys kind of had great, like, argumentative yet romantic banter. We're not going to help you. The audience has to. The audience has to. Well, <laughs> That's right. We'll they have to go. But um, at any rate, is this part of the show? Like the audience has to chime in and fill in the blank. Like, yes, exactly. Like, this is their career. <laughs> it's like the New York Times crossword puzzle. It's just like that. Mm -hmm. okay. So several many years later, um, I uh, was a guest director at Keen Company, uh, and uh, I was directing a play called Lemon Sky a play by Lanford Wilson, which was his sort of version of Glass Menagerie, his memory play. And we were looking for someone to play the, the dad, who was a kind of complicated uh, figure in this one boy's life or in Lanford Wilson's life. And, you know, the role had usually been played by someone who was just mean and awful from the get-go. Like the moment he stepped on stage, you were like, oh my God, this dude is in for trouble. Well, I kind of thought, let's make a more interesting choice this time. And how about if we cast someone who actually on the outset appears incredibly genial and lovely and loving, and then slowly as the play progresses, we start to discover some of his more darker impulses. And so I don't know, so we, we started talking with the casting director and your name came up and I immediately thought back to that sitcom, which I thought was hilarious. And then also I remembered seeing you in dinner with friends. And I was like, okay, this is a charming guy who I bet could go off. <laughs> so um, we made Kevin an offer. It all worked out wonderfully. He joined the he joined the show. He did you did such an amazing job. It was such a special special show, like such a special show. Amazing cast. You all became an amazing family. And um, since then, I've just been lucky to call you a friend for so long. Kevin is one of Keen Company's great supporters. He comes to so many shows and we always go out afterwards with his amazing wife, Jordan Baker. Woo Shout out Jordan Baker. Amazing actor. Uh, we go across the street at West Bank and he always knows everyone in there and always has amazing stories. <laughs> so welcome back to Keen Company, Mr. Kevin Kilmer. Oh my gosh. Okay, I need another drink. <laughs> <laughs> Johnny, I that's very kind. That was unbelievable. And the memories with Keen are um, incredibly, uh, immensely powerful with me still, you know. It was an incredible family, and Keith Nobbs was an inc our, our incredible lead. And um, but everybody in that company, you know, Amy and Amy Tedesco, um, Alyssa May Gold. Uh, uh, we also had jo was it Josh, Josh Bradford, and um, and of course Kelly Overby, the great Kelly Overby, who I love. Um, Kelly's my stage wife. My wife understands these things. <laughs> sure. <laughs> you know? And uh, 
that was a wonderful, wonderful company. And I don't, I have to say this because I'll, I'll, I'll forget to say it, but I have never, ever worked with anybody who was a more enthusiastic, happier director. In my <laughs> it's not even close. It's not even close. And I remember that I think I blew something through my nose the first time we did like a read through and you listen, you were listening. And then all of a sudden there was this quiet pause and he went, okay, that was great. Like, <laughs> like, <laughs> I started laughing so because you were so enthusiastic that I was just I, and I remember coming home to Jordan and saying, you know, this guy is just he's like it's like someone's plugged him in every day. And I'm so happy to be with him because he empowers you to feel like you can do anything. And that and for actors, that's that's an unbelievable gift. You know, for any actor, they'll say that any director can make them feel like they can do it um, and and take really big risks and maybe do something that is unexpected or hasn't been done before in the role uh, before, um, you know, you're, you're grateful for that. Oh, well, thank you, Kevin. I, oh my gosh, do I miss that family? And do I miss rehearsal where we actually get to do that? Um, the two other people in the cast are Logan uh, right. Riley Bruner, Logan Bruno, and right? Zach, oh my gosh, I'm blanking on his last name. Zach was like 10 years old. These were two, they played, they were kids. They were like nine and 11 years old. And right. Zach was like the littlest, tiniest thing. And all he wanted to do was be in The Lion King. That's how <laughs> we got in the theater. And right. he did the tap dance, he did everything. And like, I just saw a picture of him on Facebook that his mom posted, and he's like, 19 and an adult, and I'm just like terrified. <laughs> what happened? The other thing, I mean, Logan was really incredibly uh, talented too. He, I remember being backstage with both of those. Logan young, says hi. Oh, Logan. You, know, you know, they were both so talented. Yeah. And I was like, <laughs> I felt like really, I, I got to get out of this business before these guys grow up because <laughs> I mean, like, I'm truly not worthy to be in the same stage as them. So, you know, they're phenomenal, phenomenal. How many years ago was that? What what year did you guys do? 2011. 2011, okay. 2011, you know, it's funny because I remember that, that summer, I, I you know, I, I never, ever, ever, knock wood, you know, get sick. And um, I, that summer I had literally had to go to the hospital for six days because I had, something called the babesiosis meets um, uh, cytomegalovirus. And my immune system had crashed and they literally couldn't figure out what was wrong with me. Like it, we eventually went to an emergency room because my, I had had a temperature for two weeks. And one of the, this hematologist was like, you know, I think it's a tick bite. But, and so I'm going to give you some antibodies for that. But he said, it could also be a fast moving uh, cancer. <laughs> we were like, what? You know, and so that's a big range to be diagnosed with. Yeah, well, wow. that's why I remember this year because it was like, at any rate, I was, I eventually was fine. It was a tick-borne disease and mixed in with a super flu thing, megalovirus, whatever. And you know, I, I eventually recovered, but I was told to take it really easy for thirty days. It was during those thirty days that I got sent this script called, from called Lemon Sky, and you know, doing a little research and finding out that it was only the only. And correct me, Johnny, about this, but I think it's the only Lanford Wilson play that is biographical, autobiographical. I believe that's correct. Yes. And it really was the reflection of 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 his life in the 1950s in America. And um and you know, coming to terms with his 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 sexuality and trying to come to find his way to becoming an artist and you know, trying to shelter in his father's you know, second home with his second wife and the second marriage. And um, it touched on so many important themes. And you know, not only was it a joy to do it, and it was truly, truly a family, but I have to say that you know, we forget, it's so easy to forget what 2011 was a right, it was, it was about then. I mean, we just, we weren't fully as conscious and awakened as a society. And I remember like in between Saturday matinees and Sunday, Saturday night shows, I would go and grab something to get to eat over on Ninth Avenue near 42nd Street. And um, I had more than one gay man stop me and thank me for reflecting their life at a certain time in a certain place in a certain America that they, that they grew up in and that they survived. And um, it was very moving. It was very powerful that when, when, if someone stops you on the street and says, you know, that was my life and 
thank you for, you know, for you and I, you know, for all of us, for the entire cast for reflecting what my life was um, and how I survived it. You know, it, it um, I remember I, 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 I felt like it's one of those times when you act, as an actor, you feel like, you know, this is why I'm supposed to be on stage and doing these things. And this is why theater is different from film and television. It, it, Cause it really is. Cause there's that, just that immediacy that's absolutely ir irreplaceable. And then we're all, we're all desperately missing right now, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh man. Really special. I mean, I gotta tell you, it was really special. And I went back and I looked at the old schedule, which I kept, we did 42 performances. Mm -hmm. And you know, for me, I could have done another forty-two, and mm -hmm. it's because it was so, so amazing, so so raw. Um, well, and, we're coming up on ten years. Maybe we'll bring it back. Is ten years long enough? We can do a revival. <laughs> well, Lanford Wilson. I mean, yeah. I, I mean, Johnny, you. I think you could say this. I mean, that was the first play that had been done since his death right. in New York City. Really? So everybody, was sort of, everybody was sort of looking at it because it was the first time he had been done since he had passed. Yeah. And I'd had the pleasure of meeting him through the other wonder, great playwright who was a dear friend of ours who's also passed now, Joe Pintaro. Mm. And, and a little bit also through Edward Albee because Jordan had done Three Tall Women. So, you know, there's this whole, <laughs> I call him the, the playwright cabal that's out there in Sag Harbor and Montauk, somewhere between <laughs> and Montauk. You know, if a hurricane hit there at the wrong time, it wiped out half of them. Out. <laughs> you know, <laughs> half of them are there. At least they, Lanford was there. You know, mm -hmm. but uh, it was just deeply, deeply uh, meaningful. And I think that he is underperformed in American theater. I really feel that way. I think he's a, a powerful, a deep writing playwright. He doesn't skate on the surface. Mm -hmm. He really does go down. Mm -hmm. and, you know. Somebody like, you know, who's done a lot more theater than me, like Kelly or my wife, Jordan Baker, you know, they would tell you that, um, you know, Lanford was a, a, a very, very critically important American playwright and, and will always be that. So kudos to you, Johnny, and, and also to uh, Carl for, for, you know, collaborating together on doing that, you know, so. Well, Carl actually handed me the script, I think about five years before we did the production. Well, and I was like, than the previous artistic hmm. director, right? Yes. And what did you think the first time you read it? Like, what did you immediately feel? I was incredibly moved mm. and I felt incredibly, um, I felt credible. I mean, Lanford's life was nothing like mine, but I felt incredibly uh, seen by the monologues that the Keith Knobs character, the Lanford Wilson um, had. I mean, it, it just really, moved me and they were all it, here. The amazing thing about that play is it was a memory play. And since it was a memory play, it was very fragmented as well. Yeah. So like he would give a monologue and there was really no stage directions about this, but he'd give a monologue and all of a sudden he'd be talking to the audience. And then all of a sudden he'd be talking to someone on stage and then it'd be back to the audience and there'd be a scene happening. And every once in a while there would be a line. He'd be like, that's not talking to someone that's directly out to the audience. Right. And I remember it was quite a challenge um, figuring that all out and figuring is this, who is this to, and what a joy and what a smart theater maker he was and a smart playwright to really mm. put that all together. But every year, so he gave me, he, maybe he gave it to me five years before every season. I was like, let's do Lanford Wilson. Let's do Lanford Sky. Let's do Lanford Sky. Let's do Lanford Sky. <laughs> it took me a while, but uh, we got there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, the other thing is, because I, I, what I remember about that is that through light and, of course, through the unbelievable performance of Keith Knobs. I mean, I, I love Keith. I miss Keith. Um, Keith. Um, and you together, you know, but both by how you blocked him and, and through the lighting. I thought not only did you make it clear, but it was fluid. It was beautifully fluid. And, he, and Keith would just go right back into scenes. And so there's like these, these moments where you were thinking and it was like there were this bubble that would go out over the audience and then boom, the lights would shift and we'd be back at, it, at each other or something, you know. And um, I have to tell you that, you know, people had such visceral, visceral reactions. And the ultimate was my mom came and, and, and my mom and dad used to come to see me in all sorts of theater. But, you know, 
my mom has uh, got a, a degree in fine arts and she's an artist herself and, 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 and an incredibly conscious human being, which I'm in, immensely lucky to have had a mom like that and grateful. And I love her so much, but she came in and she saw the show and literally as it came off, she literally went into one of these jags that like a four or five year old goes into where you can't catch your breath and the tears are rolling. This is like after the play, I'm walking out and she's like, I, I want people to no, no, you're not, not like that. <laughs> she just couldn't hear. She was really disturbed by this, the, this man that I was playing who was, you know, violent and, uh, you know, a bit of a misogynist, and, you know, a bit of homophobic and other things, you know, like a lot of, men who um, who were limited, you know, brilliant in certain areas. He had his own brilliance, but he was very limited in other areas. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, it took me 20 minutes to calm my own mother down. Uh, like, mom, mom, it's just a play. It's a play. I'm <laughs> glad it affected you, but I'm your son still. And like, you know, mm -hmm. let's go to the West Bank where everybody knows me. No. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Oh, God. So Kevin. Yes. Um, we like to sort of delve in a little bit to our guests' lives. So we're going to ask you some really personal questions. No, I'm, I'm kidding. Um, uh, we like to learn a little bit about sort of how you got into the work you do now. And if you could tell us maybe a little something about how you started to, you know, either get into theater or knew that this was the thing for you or whatever you want to tell us. Were you always a theater kid? No. No. Okay. No, it, it's interesting because you know what it is, Ashley, right? I, I literally had a meeting last week. I've been mentoring a young lacrosse player at Johns Hopkins because I was a lacrosse player there. Oh, I do remember and, that. And um, so there's like a pod of mentors. There's like five or six of us, and we handle like five or six of the young of the players, and they're anywhere from freshmen to seniors. And um, I had gone to Johns Hopkins to play lacrosse and, and grew up playing sports. I had two experiences with theater that were really important and did stick very deeply with me. One was I played, um, uh, I was in the Wind in the Willows and I played Toad of Toad Hall in Wind in the Willows when mm -hmm. I was 12 years old in sixth grade. And I went to an, ele an Episcopal elementary school where that was the graduating class. So this was like the spring production. And we had an English teacher, he, he taught, um, he was from England, excuse me, I mean, uh, a guy named Bill Ellis, who Bill uh, loved theater. He cast the whole show. And I remember literally we had, we had uh, 10 boys and four girls in the, in the, in the sixth grade class. And, it, and he, as he's casting the play, you know, who's playing Rat, who's playing Badger. And he said, in the final role, he said, to play Toad of Toad Hole, we'll have Mr. Kevin Kilner because he has the biggest mouth in sixth grade. <laughs> You know, he cannot shut his mouth. You know? <laughs> so I had this great time and we did it, I think, for two weekends, maybe like four or five shows or something like that. Uh -huh. And I never, ever forgot how wonderful that was. I learned how to improvise because a cap gun that was supposed to go off that I was supposed to load didn't go off. And on <laughs> this day, I remember the line was, you know, the captain doesn't go off and, you know, Badger or somebody says, you know, Tony, why'd you do that? And Toad's supposed to say, I just wanted to see if, if it would go off. And I, it didn't. And the whole audience had heard the click instead of the bang. So I said, I just wanted to see if it would go off. And then somehow I made a perfect beat. And I went, and it didn't. I just didn't <laughs> that line. And it brought the house down. And I never, ever forgot that. And then as a senior in high school, um, I remember there was a very, a very pretty TA who used to walk around in a very tight fitting outfit. And she came over to the cafeteria table one day where all the athletes were sitting. And she said, she leaned down and she said, I need guys who can lift girls over their heads for how to succeed in business without really trying. Anybody want to join me? And like, she like had this like low really? cup, and I was like, I'm in, I'm in, I'm okay. You can do that. You know, also had a great time. It was just a lot of fun being in the chorus and, and singing and dancing and, and moving around. But then, you know, I, I'd always been in sports. I go to Hopkins. I played, I was very average player, truly very average player. I played with some really phenomenal players and ended up playing on three national championship teams. And as I graduated, I didn't know what I was going to do. I had a liberal arts degree with a, I, had a, I have a degree in social and behavioral sciences, took a lot of psych courses in history. And I'm like, what am I going to do with my life? So of course I went to work for a bank. 
And um, I was a credit analyst and then I was a commercial loan officer. And as I slid into, to, in, literally slid into to, to depression, <laughs> the top five days a week. Um, and, you know, one day I was out with a, 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 a woman who was a friend of mine and, and we used to go to lunch together and she, she, she had a master's degree from Tulane. And she said, you know, you're smart enough to do this work. But she goes, I look at you and I see a guy with a surfboard under his arm. I just like, this doesn't seem like it's you. <laughs> uh-huh. And uh, so I started taking classes at night and I took a couple semesters of journalism, a couple semesters of fiction writing. But the life of a writer, as we know, is, is kind of lonely and singular. Mm-hmm. And I That's had why always, they're all out in Montauk. That's why they're all out in Sacramento. Yeah, exactly. But um, I had always done these team sports and, you know, it just was in my blood from the time I was seven years old that I wanted to be a part of some group of people that that made things and storytelling. Um, you know, my parents had always taken my sister, um, my sister Mary Stewart and I to the theater, you know, at least once a year, if not twice a year. You know, at least one of those things was always the nutcracker. And, um, <laughs> and we loved it. And also, we both had, we all had a love of, of films and going to the movies together as a family. And I just remember, you know, literally as I was literally crying myself to sleep at night thinking, you know, at age 25, I was like, my life is freaking over. I have no idea what I'm going to do with my life. And on one day, literally, when I walked out of the bank headquarters and was getting lunch, I stopped and got one of those free newspapers on the street corner that, you know, had the, you know, evening classes and it was like an introduction adult evening introduction to acting class and I said what the heck I'm going to take it so in a little second floor studio on Charles Street in downtown Baltimore after I finished work at the bank I took my first acting class and literally that first night I was like I you know some people can call it arrogance but just something in my bones went oh I can do this I can do this This looks like fun this feels like fun to be able to slip into somebody else's shoes, somebody else's skin, that's that's cool. So I formulated an idea to leave the bank. I became a manager, an office manager for a little bit more money at a mortgage banking company. I was gonna stay there for a year. I ended up staying for eight months. And in February of 1985, I moved to New York and just started studying and, and you know went through a two year Meisner programs, studied voice and diction, lost as much of my dialect as I can lose. <laughs> Very strong and studied movement and um, and ended up because I, I again I just this is where actors have to get lucky I, I ended up with a management group that managed these young uh, they managed these children and had a children's theater and as the children grew up they became mm-hmm. talent managers named Gene Niederlitz and Ann Steele and they were in the old Fisk building on Broadway and but they were managing people like get a load of this Jason Alexander Alex Winter. Uh, Michael Knight, who won the Emmy from All My wow. Children, they had a they had a client list that was ridiculous, and I literally used to take Jason out to lunch because he had just done the rink with Liza and William. Was everybody knew he was going to become mm-hmm. a big star. I used to buy him lunch just to to ask him t- you know dozens of questions and how do you do this? How do you do that? And who would what would you do? And he taught me, and um, and I ended up with some good people. And anyway, that's the long short story or short long story. <laughs> <laughs> I, love it. I didn't even really come to New York till I was 27. And I'll, I'll end with how I started. These young men that I'm, were, I'm now a mentor to, you know, one of the things said last week, which I tell young people all the time, and, and Jordan and I both teach acting. Um, she's doing it at university level now, and, and I, I've done it one-on-one and, and classes when I'm asked, um, which is that, uh, you, you know, you have to try everything. And you have to learn what you don't want to do in life. You have to learn, you have to fail at a lot of stuff. And God knows between t- age 22 and me in New York at age 27, those five years, some of them were absolutely torturous and mostly torturous for my family who, you know, I was sometimes mean and, you know, a pain in the butt to, mm-hmm. I was so miserable, but I was, tr- at least I was trying different things. I was trying to figure out if I wanted to be a journalist. I was trying to figure out if I wanted to write fiction or poetry. I was trying to, figure out, you know, something, you know, acting, whatever. But, and I had the guts to, or I shouldn't say the guts. It was really, there was no no choice for me. I was like, I'm going to go to New York. If I fall on my face, if I fail, I can go home. Um, But it's important for young people to know and hear that, you know, it's mainly, you just got to try lots of things. And and most of it, I mean, 90% of it, you got to fail at or hate. One or the other, like you don't like it. I'm definitely not one of like, you know, as my young niece Katie's do, as Kate has learned recently, as she worked at, you know, as the assistant 
head of the department, the paint department at Home Depot, you know, down in Maryland while she's, you know, taking some time off from college because of COVID. Mm -hmm. She's like, I don't want to be a manager in a paint department. Well, that's good to know. I mean, that's really good to know. And, you know, my nephew, Nick, her brother, you know, it's like, you know, uh, I, I like working in nurseries, but you know I don't want to work them in, in on them in Brooklyn, where you're using usually having to transport dozens of bags of soil to rooftop gardens because that's like killer, you know. So yeah. you find out these things you don't want to do, and and if you are um, focused enough, you eventually will land on that thing that where you just say, oh wow, I I I do this almost for free because it's just so much. That's the thing I want to do. That's some wise. I had no idea that you just by chance picked up a newspaper and was like, okay, let's try this acting thing. Yeah. You know, I, it's the newspaper was almost like, like the final thing, actually, you know what it is? Cause yeah. I, I had been kind of thinking about it in the sense right. that in my misery, literally, I would take myself to the movies and I'd sit there alone in movie theaters and I'd be watching them. And hmm. one of my heroes was uh, Spencer Tracy. And I remember reading um, uh, uh, Garson Kanan's book, uh, Hepburn and Tracy, and was completely smitten by it. And I'd also read William Goldman's Adventures in the Screen Trade. And I had been thinking about it. So when I opened that newspaper and literally, like I think I might've, if I turned one page, maybe that was the most, but I think to my, in my dream, it was like, I opened it and it was like introduction to acting class. I was like, okay, this is a sign. Okay. Cause I've been thinking about it all the time, all along anyway. And you know, you know the old saying, it's like you have to work your ass off to get lucky. Mm -hmm. And my my parents and my grandparents and just the pure luck of where I, where I was born and who I was born to certainly taught me work ethic. But um, I also knew, and I'm, I don't believe in, you know, I don't believe in like gaslighting myself, but I, I mean, for sure, I took a I took an, a, a Meisner intensive for six weeks, six, six weeks in the summer of 1986. Mm -hmm. And we met three days a week, four hour classes, three days a week. And I know that within that 12 to 15 people in that class, I'm, I'm not kidding you when I say that I was one of the two to three least talented people in that class. <laughs> but I saw what real talent was. There were some a couple of really talented um, uh, people in there. And, and uh, a, a, an old a buddy of mine named Jimmy Georgiatis, who was extremely talented and gone to Rutgers and studied with William Esper. And Jimmy and I sort of have bonded, you know, in that summer. And, and I picked, you know, asked, took him out for a cup of coffee and picked his brain about, you know, where to study. And, and then I remember Catherine surprised me at the end of the six weeks. She said, you know, if you want, I have a position open in, in September. I think you, you could do this. And I looked at her and I said, well, you'll never get me to cry because I, I don't know how, you know, I mean, guys, <laughs> and people don't cry there, you know, and uh and she, I remember she, you know, rightfully so, she sort of laughed at me and she said, you know, why don't you leave the teaching of acting to me? Don't worry about that. Just jump in with both feet. So I jumped in and, um, you know, it, 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 it's, it's one of these things where like I, to this day, I, I know I'm how fortunate I am because I, there are people that I just look up to who are like on the Mount Olympus of actors. And, and then, you know, like I see someone like Jason on Broadway or, some of our incredible, like a Hugh Jackman or something like that. And I'm like, you know, I'm truly not worthy because <laughs> I can't sing. I can, I can move a little bit, but you know, um, you know, I can talk sing. I, I did play the Pirate King and the Pirates of Penzance. And because the Pirate King can sing rough, I decided to make him a growly rough singer. And that, I was like, I remember one day I was getting ready to go on stage to do that at the Young Vic Theater in Baltimore. And I, would, and I remember saying to myself, Wow, you just like went straight straight from comedies and straight plays to a light opera, and you <laughs> musicals, which are kind of in between, you know. Right, like right. opera, I had my arm around a guy who was a graduate of a music academy who had a four octave range, and my arm was shaking the power that was coming out of him during some huh. of the songs in, in Pirate King. Right. And I'm like, okay, this is what real singing is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not worthy, you know. Like, you know. So what was uh, what was one of your first um, professional jobs? And you can I, I'm gonna I'm gonna say this could either be theater or film and TV. Well, I, I'm gonna stick to theater and say that the first meaningful job was you know was getting my equity card with a glass menagerie at a, at a theater that 
um, I want to say was it fairly Dickinson that was it was called like the American Stage Company or something, and I'm you know it, Paul Servino was the artistic director of. I remember that. Oh wow! And Paul Servino fired the director, literally fired him the day before we opened. It was oh, like, no. but I and then redirected the play. But I I got oh, my, my gosh, and and that was and and I remember. You know, this is like, these are old school actor stories because in some ways this New York doesn't exist anymore. But I was um, I was uh, auditioning for um, a commercial and and the casting director, who was a, a really gentle and lovely person, I said, you know, I'm going to go in there because I, I heard that she was casting Glass Menagerie and I thought, I think I could be really good as a gentleman caller. And then... I said to, said to myself real quick, I'm like, okay, you know, because there was a whole room full of people and I'm like, okay, she's behind. Let's uh, let's do the audition. And maybe between the time she says, okay, thanks. And, and the door, you might have like 15 seconds, uh -huh. which is exactly what I had, <laughs> 15 seconds. And I looked at her and I said, listen, it's really, really important to me that I, I, I just, I know you're casting Glass Menagerie and I think I'd be a really good gentleman caller. And I was just wondering if they could, like, I could just have an audition slot maybe. And she looked at me and she said, hmm. she kind of looked at me and she went, yeah, I think you might, you might make a good gentleman caller. Okay, we'll get a slot. I wasn't in equity. I, I didn't know, I had never, wow. never been on stage in New York other than I did a graduate scene for my two year Meisner program um, in, in, uh, in the basement of the old Nat Horn Theater, which doesn't exist anymore. And mm -hmm. other than that, I really hadn't, and you know, the high school and twelve, you know, in sixth grade, I that was, you know, the, that would be like the fourth time I was ever on stage. Uh -huh. So that was wow. really, really uh -huh. important because it showed me that you had to like kind of go for it as an actor and make your own work, or, or I shouldn't say make your own work, make your own opportunities. And then that was followed up by, I did that in the fall of '86, uh, and then. Sometime in December, we finished in November. It was like for September to November. And when we finished, uh, sometime in December, I was on the phone with a friend of mine and she said, you know, um, I know the director who's doing Streetcar Named Desire in Columbus, Ohio. You, you should go do that. I mean, you'd be really good. In, in, and I thought to myself, do I want to do two Tennessee Williams plays back to back? Yes, yeah, because I love Tennessee Williams, but why not? But, but I remember saying to her, well, you know, I'm kind of maybe working with this agent now and if she can get me in and blah, 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 I was kind of like skating around and she, she stopped me and said, Hey, stop, shut up. I have his contact information. You're going to contact the director. Do you understand? I'm like, and I was like, uh, okay, but like, you might think I'm a joint. I don't care. You're like perfect. For the well, long story short, I ended up getting it and I got to do it with wow. Michael. And um, and the director is the now deceased Ed Stern, who was the artistic director at Cincinnati uh, Playhouse or Playhouse in the Park in Cincinnati, and had taught at Rutgers. And Ed was a wonderful, he's a wonderful human being and a wonderful and brilliant director. Um, and there was an it was an incredible cast that included Gordana Rashevich, who's a bit of a New York theater legend, and she was literally, literally incandescent in that role. Um, mm. And that those were both important because yeah, I was in regional theater and I was learning my craft and um, and I was young still. You know, I mean, I, I think I was thirty or something. You know, at the time. Um, but they were seminal moments because I learned so many things both on stage and off about what you have to do if you want a life in the theater or if you want a life if you want to have a career as an actor. Now, I saw you in a production of Glass Menagerie. I was going to say, we have to get to the bookend of that. Exactly. That, that show has been such an um, epic part of your career, it sounds like. Well, I mean, I think that anyone, any actor in the American theater who, who ever, ever gets to work with or ever got to work with uh, the, the, speaking of incandescent, the, the unforgettable Julie Harris, um, mm -hmm. It's just one lucky son of a gun, you know. <clears throat> I'm, mm. I'm, I, you know that that cast was Julie Harris, Jelko Ivanic, uh, who is, as Tom, and uh, Callista Flockhart as Laura and myself. Mm. And you know, 
all three of those actors. I mean, Jelko has won the Emmy and is a brilliant actor. Mm -hmm. Chris is a brilliant actress. Um, nobody, you know, she was a well known within New York theater, especially New York downtown off Broadway theater. She was, you know, got one award after another, and she was like the hot thing. I remember that, and it was like, then it was like Kevin who. who? <laughs> <laughs> And for patrons who don't know, Kevin was in the 50th anniversary of Bus Menagerie, um, which is the production we're talking about. Yeah, and you know, I, I was um, my former manager had uh, known um, the director of of Bus Menagerie, the Broadway production, um, and had written him a letter saying, "I have a young actor who I think." Um, is is that he wrote is in capital letters the gentleman called <laughs> and um, wow. doesn't like no acting is required kind of thing and so I uh, Frank Galati from Steppenwolf Theater was was the director of it and, he, and Frank said one of the most you know I, I, I'd say yeah I'd like to put Frank and Johnny in a, in a room together because they they could literally light the room up even if there was no <laughs> Frank is incredibly loving and supportive, always smiling. He's a big bear of a guy. And um, and so Frank gave a time slot to me to audition. And Jordan was doing Three Tall Women at the time. Um, and it had become a big hit. It hadn't won the Pulitzer yet, but it had put Edward Albee back in New York theater, which he literally was persona non grata for over a decade. And people forget that. But he was completely unwelcome in New York theater for a long time. And so Jordan was doing that play. She was also working during the daytime uh, still <laughs> because it was, she was working off Broadway and you know, you don't make enough money to <laughs> go. So I remember I had the audition on a Monday and I had been working my butt off and they had given it, they had given almost the entire second act to me, literally like 22, 23 pages of sides. And it was so important to me that I had memorized every single word to, to be, it was important for me to be off because I just wanted to see what would happen. And Jordan came home literally from the eighth show that week on a Sunday night. And at like 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night on a Sunday night, I'm running lines with her. And she finally just like throws a script down and yells at me. And she goes, you know what you're doing wrong? You know, you know what you have to do right? And I was like, uh, uh. I said, don't act. And she said, that's right. Stop <laughs> acting. <laughs> you were born to play this role. So just like, just literally be in the moment. I got to go to bed. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> now she's watching. So watch out. We're going to get this back checked mm. in the comments. Oh, yeah. So I go in the next day and I'll never forget. I went into the room and um, Frank was sitting there. The reader had brought me into the room. The casting director was there and there was this tiny woman next to Frank. And Frank um, got up and he said, um, I would like to, I have the great pleasure of introducing you to Ms. Julie Harris. And I literally like, I think my mouth, like my jaw open and I just said, I, I, I can't believe I'm meeting you. In my mind, I've always told people, I mean, this is just my weird mind, but I was like, like, where do you put five Tonys? Does she have one on the back of the toilet and one over the mantle? <laughs> it's this woman who's won five Tonys. Yeah. She is American theater legend, you know? And um, mm. so I, I was, I didn't, thank God I didn't say anything stupid. I just said, it's just an incredible pleasure to meet you. And I remember walking to the corner of the room. It was kind of a bigger room and it, and it, and it was on Ninth Avenue. And, um, that film building, I remember it was there. And I remember walking into the corner room and I I sort of blanked and I knew I had just blanked. And I turned around and Frank like looked at me like, what? <laughs> and I said, and I and he was smiling because he was always smiling. He's like you, Johnny. He's like always smiling, Frank. He's always positive. <laughs> and um, I, I remember saying to him, I have no idea what's about to happen. And Frank, to his great to it, the, one of the greatest gifts that's ever been given to me is he stopped smiling and he looked at me and he said, I want you to know that whatever's going to happen, you're in a safe place. And I said, okay. And I went and about halfway through, like around page 12 of the 22, um, I'm looking at the reader and I'm just, it, I mean, I'm, I just lost track of space and time and it's just happening in the moment. And um, these tears, are rolling down her face. 
And I had done a bunch of research at Lincoln Center on all the prior productions. And I knew how the gentleman caller had been played. And I just didn't want to do it that way. And I'm kind of stubborn. And I just said, you know what? It's either going to be the way I want to do it or not. I thought, what if this guy who was a little bit above Tom and not much, who had been the class president and the, you know, the captain of the basketball team and all that stuff, what if he had literally had a break and had literally either had a nervous breakdown or, um, or just was in a kind of depression that I remember prior to making a commitment to becoming an actor? And I also had one other image in my mind after reading all those clippings at Lincoln Center Library. And that was when I have to, when I kiss her and then I have to tell her that I, I can't call on her again, I made, I decided to make him Catholic. And therefore, if, if you're engaged as, if you're engaged and you have to, and you kiss another woman than the woman you're engaged to, then it's that you've committed a mortal sin as a Catholic. And, and then I thought that the confession, like she was my priest, I had to confess to her that I can't call on her again, that that literally should be like pulling broken glass or barbed wire out of my stomach every night, every show, that it should be the most incredibly hard and difficult thing to ever, ever say to someone, because you know, when you're saying it, that you will cleave that human being's heart literally in two, and you will destroy them psychologically for the rest of their life, because you know, you're doing two things wrong. One is you've kind of lied and you've committed a sin. And then the second thing is, is that, you know, you know, she'll never escape from this home and her mother. And it's like game over. So that's what happened in the room. And I left, when I finished, I just said, thank you. I, I appreciate it. And I like literally left in and like, you know, the, the door almost hit me in the ass. I was pulling it so hard. And the reader came out to the elevator that I was waiting for. And she said, she said, that was unbelievable. You're coming back tomorrow. And you know, da, 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 da. and I went back the next day, I read with Callista. I read with a someone who I didn't know named Cherry Jones, mm -hmm. and I was like, you know, like this will. <laughs> later on, I was like, this will never happen again. <laughs> and, <laughs> but, you know, but, uh, but, um, and it went well, but it didn't go as well as like the prior day. I mean, it didn't have that kind of like lost track of space and time feeling of mm -hmm. the prior day. And then I went to do a little comedy, an original comedy at the Miniature Theater of Chester in Western Massachusetts, where. And we started like the next week and this was like late May and, you know, and then it was for the whole summer and I'm doing it, this little church turned theater, you know, doing these shows and all the actors lived together in a farmhouse on top of this little mountain. And in those days there was like no cell phones. It was like, there was one phone in the farmhouse and in early August or late July, I forget what it was. The phone rang one afternoon. I had thought Menagerie had gone a long time, gone away. I'd heard that they were looking for a name, blah, blah, blah. And uh, I picked up the phone and my agent said, he didn't even say hi. He just, he said, Julie Harris has insisted that you be in this production and they're offering you the role finally. And, I, I was like, point, Julie Harris. <laughs> and, you know, talk about, you know, feeling like you've been gaslit. I said, I, I started to cry and I said, uh, don't, don't lie to me. Don't, please don't lie to me. Exaggerate because you can't do that at this moment. And he said, no, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. I swear to you, I'm not. The first day of rehearsal on the first break, I said to Julie, I told her the story and I said, like, you know, someone told me this, my agent told me this, I don't know, is it, you know, and she looked at me and she said, oh no, Kevin. She said, the reason I became an actor when I was 17 years old was I saw Lorette Taylor in Chicago in 1944 do Glass Menagerie. And when that play, that show finished, I sat in the seat until the entire theater was empty. I didn't know who I was. I didn't know where I was. I knew I wanted to become an actor. Lorette Taylor had done it for me. And she set my entire course on, on a certain path for the rest of my life. And I've seen every production of The Glass Menagerie. And she had done the national recording with Montgomery Clift playing Laura in the early 1950s. Wow. And so she said, I've seen many productions of The Glass Menagerie. But she said, you know, I had never seen The Gentleman Caller until I saw you do the gentleman caller. And I knew I had to work with you. And I said, you had to work with me? <laughs> said, oh, yes, darling. She said, what you're doing is revelatory. Wow. 
Um, so, you know. Wow. Anyway, you, you know. Off the ground after that one. <laughs> yeah, it's like, like, you know, I ended up, you know, going through rehearsals and, you know, Frank didn't say that much to me during rehearsals. And I remember the night before we did our first preview, I said to him, I pulled him aside quietly and I said to him, Frank, I got to tell you the way I'm doing this, like, you know, I haven't been saying much. And I just like, they will either love this or I will literally never work in New York theater again. I'll be like living in a rail out because I'm doing it differently than anybody's done it. And he looked at me and he stopped smiling again. Only the second time I saw him stop smiling. And he said, Kevin, don't change a note. And he used the same word. He said, what you're doing is lovely. Mm. And it gave me the courage wow. to do it. And long story short, you know, I don't read reviews when I'm doing a production, but you know, the artistic director um, of Roundabout said, you got it, you must. And we, you know, the Times had given a bit of a love letter to uh, uh, to the cast and me and Callista in particular. And, um, you know, I, I, you know, I, I, Jelka was brilliant as Tom and, and Julie was about the funniest Amanda I've ever, ever seen. And, <laughs> You know, I've, I've had the great pleasure of seeing Cherry do Amanda since then, and and she was brilliant in her own way and unique. Um, but it's just, uh, you know, I I've never been back on Broadway, but if I would, you know, if a bus hit me tomorrow, I'd be perfectly happy because there's not many human beings who ever get to Broadway. And the way I got to Broadway was in a, in, a, in an American classic with an incredible cast that supported. We all supported each other and an incredible director and. It doesn't get much better than that, so I'll I'll take it. You know, that's I, all. I I remember that production very well. I really like it. It I remember loving it, and I distinctly remember your scene with her. You guys were so good. Um, it broke my heart, and like I feel like you see that place. I've seen it so often. Yeah, and I take that role a bit for granted sometimes, um, but it was heartbreaking well that's the word that's you know johnny that's the word i you know look why do we go to the theater i mean i'm sorry but like uh, now i've gotten like a bit old and crotchety in the sense that like i've seen a lot of theater now i've read a lot of theater i'm old enough to know that you know if you're not if you're not moved if you if you aren't laughing and crying and and everything if you're not moved then what did, what did you pay your money for i mean i always think of the audience yep and I've told younger actors, because I've seen other productions of Menagerie as well. I've seen multiple productions of Menagerie. My problem is that Tennessee Williams is, is still arguably, if not the greatest, one of the five greatest American playwrights. And he didn't write any, any weak-ass caricatures. He didn't. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it's, diff it, there, it's, it's, it's a kind of a tricky way to do The Gentleman Caller, but... I don't, if you do them as a caricature, if you do them as just like, come on, you know, Laura, let's just yeah. take, take night school classes with me and we'll, we'll beat this thing, you know, like who cares? And I used to say that to myself, you know, and, and, uh, you know, I shared it with Frank and I've shared it with Jordan and other people, which is like, the reason that scene is almost 20 pages in the candlelight is that he wanted your heart to be cleaved in two. Yep. And you don't get your heart cleaved in two if you don't care about both of them. Right. Not just her, not just Laura. You have to care about both people. And you and it's up to each actor. I mean, some roles you find easy doors to open into, you connect immediately. In other roles, you know, you like you don't get it until like maybe the night before you're doing previews or you're in previews and finally there's a light bulb that goes on, whatever, a door opens and you're like, ah, that's that's not supposed to be. You know, I just had this strong take on it and it just happened to be, I think, the right take because those four characters you're supposed to care about all of them. And I'm sorry. I mean, Jelko, I'd listen to Jelko do the that final monologue. I mean, if that, that is maybe the great, it's like one of the three greatest monologues written in the American theater for closing a play. I mean, blow out your can candle, Laura. I mean, that should break your heart in two as well. I mean, the loneliness and 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 the pain of what he's gone through. Um, that's why we go to the theater. So I, I don't, I didn't like the fact that a lot of people write the gentleman caller off as a bozo. I, uh, there's never been a role I've ever done on stage or in front of a camera where I want someone to go, oh, well, you know, I'm just going to write them off. I mean, what's the point? Yeah. 
I'd rather not get hired. I mean, and God knows that's happened a lot. You know, <laughs> I've, I've lost lots of stuff at callbacks where the director is like, you know, but I really want you to kind of do it this way. And I'm thinking like in my head, I'm like, well, then hire the person that's going to do it that way because that's not the way I interpret it. Mm-hmm. I, I always go for the humanity, the humor. Um, it's sort of like what you said, Johnny. It's like if, if you if you you either show them one thing on the outside and then and then they, you reveal something deeper, darker on the inside or, or you know, or just occasionally there's roles that are written where you you see right into the, the core of a character right away. And then you see how they build some um, shell, some some uh, something that gets them through life. You know, um, you can work outside in, you can work inside out. It, it doesn't matter how you connect it's lo- as long as it works doesn't matter which way you start with, you know, that and good shoes. I always, when I get with costumers, the first thing I always ask for are the shoes. Cause <laughs> and John, you'll remember this. I like, I like to wear the shoes in rehearsal. Cause I like to feel the shoes that he's wearing. Cause like Willie Loman's shoes are a particular kind of shoes, you know? Yep. So. Wow. I, by the way, I did see um, Jelko on, a. I believe it was a bus, may have been the subway, I can't remember, after the show. And I was incredibly starstruck and I took the entire <laughs> trip going like, should I say something to him? No, I can't say something to him. Oh, <laughs> you should have. You should have. You should have. Oh, <laughs> Absolutely, you should have, man. You know? It's funny when well, you're we're on a subway. Um, do you want me to tell you a real quick funny story about uh, uh, about Dinner with Friends? Yes, yeah, definitely. So Dinner with Friends, which won the Pulitzer in 2000, and and it was I think Donald Margulies. Uh, the, he had been nominated like three times, but he had, Donald hadn't won it yet. Um, I remember in rehearsals, I said to him, I said, I said, there's, there's something special about this play. I think you know you're going to be very happy with certain things, and um, so. You know, I uh, uh, I remember doing it with Julie. It was the original cast was Julie White and uh, Lisa um, Maverick and myself, Julie and Lisa. Oh my God, who's a brilliant New York theater actress? At any rate, Matt and I uh, have a scene in a bar, and it's in the second act, and it's a scene that was it was it was the old um, theater that it doesn't exist anymore over on Second Avenue, and it, it, we were on one of the first off Broadway shows that had a rotating turntable set, and they, it was really put close to the lip of the stage. It, it was a five hundred seat theater um, for four ninety nine, whatever it was off Broadway. So the audience is like literally right there, and Matt and I are doing this bar scene one night. And I'm stage right facing left. He's left facing right. And and there's this young woman, as we're doing this intense scene about he, where he's like saying, you know, why did you blow up your marriage? And you know, what what about your kids and all this stuff? And I, I and, and there's this young woman who opens literally a bag of Twizzlers this big, <laughs> one of those crinkly big plastic bags of Twizzlers. And I'm and I'm looking at Matt and Matt like if the audience is that way I'm looking at Matt and Matt Matt is going. <laughs> <laughs> I did one of these things where I just started leaning like over to go like in my, in my eyes I'm going in my eyes I'm going Matt stay with me stay with me, stay with me. <laughs> stay with me. Just ignore it and the the crinkling is getting louder and oh, louder no. and Matt Arkin who's part of the legendary Arkin family and they are incredibly gifted actors and uh, and they got a wild side to them too i see my matt's eyes are like i'm gonna go i'm gonna go i'm gonna go <laughs> as i lean further and further and it, it, he had most of the dialogue and in this moment where it became my dialogue in this perfect moment where i was supposed to where i usually did take a beat each night in that moment you see matt went like this he, he literally went stop that now <laughs> And he went like that, and he went right back to me. And we were like, stop <laughs> now. Boom. And, and I remember looking at him like going, holy shit, I can't believe that he just did that. <laughs> we end uh, the scene, and we go upstairs because the, then, then the women um, had a, a scene next. And we're going up the stairs, and Matt's like, 
God, son of a bitch. Where's the house manager? I want those people thrown out. I want that. Are you kidding me? Like, you can't do this in the theater, right? And I'm trying to calm that down. Cut to the show ends. We're leaving. Matt and I used to take the subway from right there at 14th Street. We would take it to 42nd Street. He would continue on the on on um, a line over to Grand Central because he was living out of the city at that time. I would continue on the red line. I would switch to the red line. So we were like on the N or the R, and and we're taking. We get on the subway, and Johnny, guess who we're sitting opposite on the subway? No girl, woman. Her boyfriend, the young woman, her Ugh. boyfriend had to be in their twenties. The other couple they were with, right? So. So, oh no! So we sit down next to him, and I immediately look like Matt was sitting on my left on the subway, and I immediately go like this: <laughs> <laughs> "What is he going to do now?" You know, and I literally see Arkin going like this, like, <laughs> "Oh no!" <laughs> and he looks at the woman, and he says, "She, she's looks. They're looking, at this and they go, oh my god.'" Oh my God, we just saw you. You guys are amazing. The play is amazing. We're arguing about it. You know, we're just like, we're still arguing about it. You guys, that was so, we're going to send friends. It's incredible. Blah, 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 blah. And Matt's like, that's good. Hey, could you hear me? And the girl looks at him and she says, oh yeah, yeah, I could hear you. Fine. And he says, yeah, because I could hear you. <laughs> Oh, and she oh. Just burst. Oh no. And Matt did this gracious thing, which is he said, Listen, I'm not here to hurt you or tell you, but he said, Never, ever again in the American theater can you open a bag of Twizzlers in the front row. Oh said, my God. Thank you for the kind words and thank you for the compliments. We're glad you enjoyed the show. And oh, it's my stop. See you. Bye. <laughs> it's off. And guess who's stuck with these guys all the way up the west, upper west side? Oh, no. and I'm like, oh my god! Hey. Just you know, sometimes he gets that way. <laughs> it's like I couldn't. So, to your point, <laughs> sometimes Johnny, it's better not to say anything. You should have said something to Jelko. I don't know if Matt was going to change the world by saying something to her, but he did. You know, which was a very funny moment. Wow! Unbelievable. Well, believe it or not, um, <laughs> as well, you know, time flies when you're having a blast. I can't believe we're at the end today, tonight. We're going to have to do this again, Kevin. Yeah. My, it would be my pleasure. You guys are great. And, um, you know, I would just want to say this. We're all uh, going to do whatever we can and pull every way we can to have Keen back on stage. You know, you know, knock wood, I'm hoping for the fall of 2021. If it isn't until 2022, whatever it is, um, Keen does the kind of off-Broadway theater that is meaningful. And that's why you have the actors. I mean, you, you've you had top, top actors who have been on, you know, Chalfant and people like that have been on Broadway and off-Broadway. And there's a reason. It's because of what Keen does and how Keen does it. So anybody that's watching this, you know, I know there are lots of believers in Keen Company watching this myself included, but um, for all your friends who don't know about Keen, tell them about Keen because Keen does it right and, and Keen does it with youth. And I'm, I'm kudos to you guys. I've told you many times, Johnny, but you know, the whole youth program is extraordinary. It, it changes people, changes people's lives. And um, I sure wish there had been a theater company out when I was young that said, hey, you know, come to the summer program. And um, um, you really, you guys don't just talk the talk, you really walk the walk. And I'm, I'm immensely proud to be a, a, an alumnus of Keene and, and a supporter of Keene. Well, thank you, thank you. Thank you Kevin. And um, you've always been a, you're always just such an amazing, you're part of the Keene family. And you always- You're stuck with me, the wild, crazy cousin. <laughs> so, may, I get to, may I get to raise a cocktail with you in person very soon? Please give one back to Jordan. Hi, Jordan. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. Thank you all. Hi, <laughs> Kevin. Oh, another one for the books.
Wow. Another one for the books. Fabulous. You know, we didn't get to Smart House, but that'll be the next episode. <laughs> That's true. Well, let's yeah. do a whole second one about film and TV, man. Exactly. I'm sure there's a lot of stories. Truly. So many stories. So many stories. Oh, a legend. Mm, absolute well, legend. Um, one of our commenters suggested that we need to get uh, Kevin and Jordan in a show together at King Company. So mm -hmm. I led away for our 2021. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. That would be amazing. That would be an amazing pairing. Mm -hmm. mm, absolutely. Well, next week, I'm very excited. We have another incredible Keen alum. We have Tony nominee Kathleen Chalfant joining us, which is so exciting. The one and she, only. Was, she was just in our Arsenic and Old Lace benefit and has done several shows. Uh, with Keen, uh, Walk in the Woods. Um, what else, Johnny? Painting the one, uh, the same painting churches. Guy. Yep. Yeah. My, Just I, incredible. Oh my God, Kathleen Chaffant. Every week we have someone amazing on, and yes, I know I'm a softy, but every one of them make me cry, if not once, twice, maybe even three times. If Johnny's not getting emotional, it's not a Keen production. So this is good. We got to stay on brand. Amen. That's right. Amen. Amen. So thank you for joining us, everyone. And um, I really hope you uh, join us next week for Kathleen Chalfant. And if you want to learn more about Keen Company, we're at keencompany.org. We're doing a whole season of audio theater this year. And um, as I say at the end of every night, I look forward to seeing you at the virtual theater soon. Thank you so much. Bye.